still here. Hand it over, that thing. Your dark soul. Dark Souls 3. Before Elden Ring released, I played this game, along with Bloodborne and Sekiro, constantly. And after nearly 18 months away from it, I wanted to go back and experience it again through the eyes of someone now very used to Elden Ring. Dark Souls 3 hasn't aged a day. And if you ask me, DS3, and in particular the two DLCs, reach highs in their boss fights that weren't matched by anything in Elden Ring, which is why going back to it after all this time has made me even more excited about Shadow of the Earth Tree. In this video, I'll give you a guided tour of Dark Souls 3. The build I used is a super powerful but also very forgiving strength build that's perfect for new players to the game or rusty old ones like me. I'll show you how to get everything set up and as usual, my tips, tricks, and general thoughts on the boss fights. The first part of the run is quite set up heavy, and the early bosses of DS3 are a little lackluster. So if you know what you're doing, or you're just here for my take on the good stuff, I'll leave timestamps below. Right, let's do it. We start as the warrior class, and I always grab the young white branch as the starting item. When you're dropped in, ditch enough equipment to get to a light load. DS3 has a really nice light roll that will serve us well in setting up our build. Clear out the first area so the enemies don't follow you and head round to the right to find this guy, the first big crystal lizard. These drop somber smithing stones, which aren't found until later in the game. Happily, they are dropped by these guys earlier on. He might take you a couple of attempts if you're new, but they're generally not that bad. Continue through the area and light the first bonfire, the Dark Souls equivalent to a grace. Then jump off the cliff nearby to some normal smithing stones for our early weapon. Now for the first boss, and this is a great opportunity to show you something cool. In DS3, the unarmed animation is a parry rather than a kick and fist parries are really good in this game. So you can unequip your weapons, parry, then swap back to your weapon to riposte. And also, backwards parries. The parry hitbox in DS3 extends all around your character. So you can parry stuff you aren't even looking at. And yes, I wish we still had this in Elden Ring. After the tutorial boss, we make it to Firelink Shrine, our hub area for the game. We're going to be coming here throughout to level up our character and upgrade our weapons. Head up the stairs and out into this area to do some cheating. Spring towards this tree and then jump to the right as you run up it. You're not supposed to be able to get up here yet, and there's some great stuff here. So grab a golden seed from the rafters, then hit this invisible wall to jump down and grab the covetous silver serpent ring. This gives you more souls from bosses, so it's an absolute no-brainer for the early game. 
speak to the firekeeper and level up. And buy a dagger from the merchant. Whenever you have spare runes in Dark Souls 3, buy first embers, then homeward bones. Homeward bones allow you to travel back to the shrine at any point without losing your runes. Now we head to the first area. Go left from the bonfire, then follow this route up and around this building to grab some lightning grease. Run through the path with all the enemies and up the stairs to this scary looking knight. Roll past him and then up more stairs to the top for a bonfire and a smithing stone. Continue exploring the area until you reach these rooftops. Drop down from here and into this building. There's a smithing stone and a golden seed in here. I'll let this full route play. When you reach the courtyard with the massive knight walking round, run straight past and turn right. Straight on from here to reach a shortcut to the first bonfire. Now head past these knights and into this building to grab the banner from this NPC. Then back out and down the big stairs to the first boss. Vor of the Boreal Valley is an incredibly easy boss. He can be a bit more problematic in his phase two, but we only need to avoid one attack to end phase two altogether. For phase one, just run underneath him and spam R1. He literally can't hit you. When you get his health down to half, he'll transition to phase two. Here, he will charge at you three times. You want to roll just as his head dips down into the ground. On his third charge, run back and roll with him to end up right next to him for his breath attack. As he starts this, lock off him, wind up a chargey, and bonk him on the head for a guaranteed stagger. Head back to Firelink and level up your Estus Flask at the Blacksmith. Later on, when we get Sacred Tears, you can use those at the Shrine Bonfire. Now for the Undead Settlement. Take note of the giant shooting arrows from that tower. He'll become important later. Head down the stairs and double back to get to these dead guys on the broken bridge. If you look closely, one of them is still moving. This is Yol. Speak to him and he'll show up back at Firelink. He'll give you one free level for every two deaths that you rack up in the early game. We're not gonna use them, but it's nice for newcomers, or if you're just having a nightmare. Then through the next area until you arrive at this courtyard. Grab a golden seed in front of this enemy and an ember just behind the tree. Now playing this game really made me realize that I should use rune arcs more in Elden Ring. Embers are basically the same thing without the great rune effects. And I always try to stay embered in DS3, but I haven't used a rune arc since my first playthrough in Elden Ring. Run through this area and take a right here to drop down and grab the dilapidated bridge bonfire. Up the road from that, we have this area, which is full of enemies. Jump onto this broken section for our first sacred tier. Now, the young white branch, our starting item. The reason that I start with this is because if this item is in your possession, that giant archer we saw at the start of the level will be your buddy and fire at all of the enemies. If you don't have it, he fires at you and that's a bit of a nightmare. Loot the area and head up through the building to this point. There's a boss in here that we're gonna come back for later. Through this door, you wanna follow this path to reach the sewers underneath this town. As soon as you jump down, Grab the Kestus from the corpse by the rats. Out the way you came and over the bridge towards the big door in the distance. Through it, we meet our best mate for this game. In Elden Ring, we have Alexander the Jar. In Dark Souls 3, we have Onion Dude. 
sadly, he doesn't have a part to play in this build, but he's still cool as fuck. We don't need anything from the next area, so run through until you make it to the halfway fortress bonfire. From here, you want to follow this route to grab two smithing stones and light the next bonfire at the crucifixion woods. Then through the swamp to grab the fallen knight armor in front of this building. And now you want to equip the Kestus in your offhand. The Kestus is my parry tool of choice in DS3. It's not as forgiving as the Buckler, but it has a super fast start. -up. So if you like parrying super late like I do, this is the one for you. These two nerds are a bit of a nightmare. But you can cheese them by jumping on this ladder. Just make sure you stay right at the top of it though, otherwise they'll jump on and yeet you off. Light the bonfire at the bottom of the ladder and head out into Miyazaki's largest poison swamp. You want to equip the dagger at this point and two-hand it. Now head left for another golden seed and a smithing stone. Then up the staircase to extinguish this flame on top of the rock formation. We need to do this with two other near identical structures in the area. Back the way you came, keeping the last bonfire on your right. When you get bogged down in the swamp, use the quick step of the dagger to scooch through it faster. Straight on will bring you to the second tower. Extinguish the flame then head around to the left side and jump off here. When you land, you'll see these two fires. You want to head straight past both of them to reach this tower and see a ramp to your left. Up this ramp, you'll find a bonfire. And a very dangerous but quick run across the bridge will bring you to the final fire. Back down the ramp for another sacred tier in the slug tower. Then to the right, to climb this ladder. At the top, run around to the right through this invisible wall to grab the Dream Chaser's ashes and the bonfire. Up the lift, then double back on yourself on the bridge and around to this area where you'll find three crystal lizards. Two drop smithing stones and one drops a gem. In DS3, gems are what allow you to infuse your weapon kill all three of them. If you miss one, just quit out and try again. Back down their ladder to grab our last smithing stone. Then down the ramp from the bonfire and along the path until you find these two knights. Wait for them to get out of your way, then take a right to the next bonfire. So for the final item of our initial setup, we need a wet blade to infuse our axe. The way to it is littered with very dangerous enemies. One of which is another giant crystal lizard, which we need to kill for another couple of sombers. Eventually, you'll come to this guy. Now this whole run is dependent on me not losing these runes and this guy one shots us. But I really want to bow again. Okay, just run past him. Continue straight on to grab the Farron Coal and quit out. Back to Firelink, give the ashes to the merchant, buy three smithing stones, level our axe to plus four and give it a heavy infusion. Now from the Crucifixion Woods bonfire, run towards this building and through the hole at the bottom. Follow your nose until you get to our next boss, the Crystal Sage. 
I usually use the second lightning grease here, but it's not really necessary. We do enough damage to brute force this fight, so just run up to it and spam R1. When the clones appear, you can identify the true sage by the purple light rather than the blue. Nothing to grab in the next area, so just run through until you come to the cleansing chapel. And here we find a strange dude with a red hood praying at the altar. Doubt he has much significance. Outside the chapel, bonk one of these enemies and grab a golden seed. Then on from there until you get to the cathedral. When you do, take a right here to grab a sacred tear from just by the cliff. Then up to what looks like the entrance and turn right to run across the rooftops. Run through all of the chaos until you reach the cathedral doors and quit out while you open them. Head left once you're through and this will lead you to a lift that is a shortcut to the chapel bonfire. Back up the lift and around to the right of the giant to grab the Lloyd sword ring. This is the DS3 version of the Ritual Sword Talisman. After exploring the cathedral a little more, you'll find our next boss, Deacons of the Deep. And these guys terrify me. Not because they're hard or anything, because they're really, really easy, and dying to them is super embarrassing. For a few extra souls and something we need later, head back to the old wolf of Farron bonfire and up the elevator. Now, this guy is a tree avatar, just a little more scary. However, there is a really cool mechanic that we can take advantage of here. If you just focus on his legs, you can break them, leaving him writhing around on the floor. Although he's a little more unpredictable like this, he's a sitting duck. Now for the first proper fight of Dark Souls 3, the Abyss Watchers. This starts off simple enough. This guy hits hard, but he's fairly easy at backstab by rolling behind him. Things get more complicated, however, when his mate joins in. But thankfully, seconds after, a red-eyed watcher will also join the fight. Now this guy isn't our friend, he'll still hit you if you get close to him, but if you keep your distance, he'll attack the second watcher while you focus on the boss. Where this fight shines though is phase two. Phase two is a 1v1 duel with a very strong watcher. His attacks leave a trail of fire and hit a lot harder than phase one. Happily, he's fairly easy to parry or backstab. Our damage is really good for this point in the game, so as long as you pick your moments, you'll be fine. Now the next area is the Catacombs of Carthus, which is a bit of a nightmare, but there's a nice little skip we can do here to cut out a lot of the suffering. From the entrance, just head right and jump down these cliffs to the bottom. Run into this corridor and immediately attack the skeleton with the funky hat. Doing this will mean that the giant skeleton ball will smash into the wall and leave you with a sacred tear. Head through the rest of the catacombs until you see this bridge. Make a run straight for it and don't look behind you. As you get to the end of the bridge, hit the ropes to destroy it. You die quite violently if you don't do that. Continue on until you get to this very dark room. Grab the item on the floor in front of you, then head back 
to Firelink to level up. On from here, we get to one of the most beautiful areas in the Soul series, Irithyll. And when I say beautiful, I mean in a from software kind of way. Run through the city until you get to these two nerds. Then take a left to find the church of Yorshka Bonfire. Out the side entrance and hug the right wall to get to another sacred tier. Then double back and down the stairs and through the next area until you reach the lake. From the lake, you want to head into this building here to grab the distant manor bonfire. Then down the stairs next to it to get to one of the most awful areas in the game. I'm going to show you the full route here to save you some suffering. The reason this area is so bad is that these enemies with the irons slowly deplete your health bar to almost nothing meaning we can get one shot by anything. When you see this crystal lizard here, kill him for a somber. When you make it outside, run past these guys and grab the golden seed from the chest in this room. Keep working your way through the area until you find the giant rats and the room with all these horrendous enemies in it. To the left, there is a side room that you can quit out in. There's another chest here with some sombers in it. Shortly after, you'll find the profaned capital bonfire. And it's a simple run through to our next boss, Yorm. Now, Yorm is again a gimmick fight, and this mechanic will be familiar to any Elden Ring players. He has 40,000 health, but there's a weapon in his arena that has special abilities just for this fight. Pick up the Storm Ruler, and hold the weapon art button to charge it whilst dodging his attacks. Once it's glowing white, hold the weapon art and R2 for an attack that will do 20% of his health bar. Repeat this for the rest of the fight. Now to complete our build, we just need a few more things. Head out from the cleansing chapel, jump down and run up this ramp. If this thing is following you, quit out to deaggro it. You don't want to deal with that. Round the corner, there is another crystal lizard for more sombers. Then back to the bridge that we destroyed earlier and climb down it to reach the smouldering lake. Here, you'll be shot by a massive ballista and find a grossly incandescent worm. Run behind the worm to this spot, where the ballista will hit the worm and kill it for a sacred tear. Then up the ramp to the right into another catacombs. This area is horrendous, but luckily we don't need to go too far into it for this build. As soon as you have the item, warp out of there. Finally, back to the dilapidated bridge to the boss that we skipped earlier, the big tree. And at this point in the game, there's no need to be delicate about this fight. Whack him in his tree balls until he's dead. Back to Firelink, to take the item he drops and give it to the little guy sitting on one of the thrones. This allows you to make boss weapons like Enya in Elden Ring. We want Yorm's great machete and Havel's ring. Grab the last couple of levels that we need and level the machete to plus three. And ladies and gentlemen, we finally have our build. If you actually remember to equip Havel's ring, we can have the gloves here too. But build guide genius over here didn't figure that out for a couple more bosses. 
So back to the distant manor bonfire and back out into the river and into the sewers on the right. Follow your nose and this will bring you to the next boss fog gate. Before you go in, head down the stairs to unlock a shortcut to the church of Yorshka bonfire. Now this is the point where the bosses in DS3 get good and Pontiff Sullivan is usually the first major roadblock for a lot of people. But we have a big bonky stick and he's parryable. Parry the first attack, take the riposte, then into a charged R2. The big problem with this fight is the clone that he summons at half health. But with our big damage, we can pretty much kill the clone as he summons him in. One extra hit is all we need. For the boss, get three parries and you're done. The only thing to grab in the next area is a somber smithing stone at the top of this tower just after a gank squad. Eventually, you'll arrive at somewhere very familiar if you're a Dark Souls 1 player. Now, there are two types of people in this world. People who think that Silver Knights are tough but super cool enemies, and people who have the Platinum Trophy in Dark Souls 3. Christ, they were dark days. Head into the building and unlock the shortcut. Run past whatever the hell this thing is, and grab the golden seed from the chest. With the shortcut open, time to head to the boss. And in Dark Souls 1, in this very room, we face Ornstein and Smo, one of the greatest From Software bosses of all time. In this game though, we get Slug Boy. This incredibly annoying clusterfuck of a boss just runs around the arena spamming the most annoying and overpowered sorceries imaginable, giving you almost no opportunity to actually attack him. Thankfully, From Software learned from this mistake and never put another annoying spell spammer in their later games. Ah. He's not actually too bad on this build. Fighting him on an int build is hellish. When he's down, we get a cutscene and are transported back to the room we were in right at the start of the game, before Vord. Pick up the items from the NPC, but don't go near the back of the room just yet. Head back to Firelink and level up. Now back to the room and go to the statue at the end to activate the next fight. One of the very best From Software bosses, the Dancer of the Boreal Valley. This fight is incredible, and hard as nails at first. Happily, with our damage, we can make light work of her. Stick to her hip as much as you can, and only use R1s, as she's very quick. In phase two, she becomes even more dangerous. Run away when she starts spinning. Then time your dodges for the last few swings once you've got into the rhythm. You can actually roll through the entire attack, but that's quite risky, especially with our low stamina. There's quite a few cool builds where you fight the dancer much earlier on in the game. If you'd like to see one of those at some point, let me know in the comments. Head up the ladder and then to the left. Run to the elevator and jump out halfway down. Sometimes this helpful knight will jump on and help you with this. Grab the golden seed, then head back to the dancer's arena and head straight on from the ladder and through to the Lothric Castle bonfire. This is actually the room where I first learned to parry. I used to run from this bonfire to this knight nearby and try to parry him for hours. Although Melania and Orphan of Cos would probably beg to differ, I still think this guy has killed me more than any other enemy in the Souls games. Progress through the castle until you reach the dragons. Then drop down off the bridge for the penultimate sacred tier. 
the next boss is Dragon Slayer Armor. And this is a good point to talk about how DS3's combat and bosses feel so different to Elden Ring. To me, the one boss that's always felt slightly out of place in Elden Ring is Godfrey. Because Godfrey's always felt like a Dark Souls 3 boss to me. The fights here are less about learning the timings of attacks and more about reacting quickly to relentless aggression. Because of this, for a lot of the later bosses in DS3, your general strat should be going for a single R1 between dodging combos for the easiest time. In phase two, the massive angel will start spamming spells at you. Don't let this distract you. They're not really a problem with our health bar, so keep your focus on dodging him. Speaking of our health, look at the size of this health bar. This area is about equivalent to the mountaintops of the giants in DS3. And here we are, chopping about with 20 vigor and not getting one shot. This is helped by my embered state, but even without it, you're a lot tankier in DS3 than you ever are in Elden Ring. Now from the Dragon Slayer Bridge, head up the ladder to the right and across the rooftops to drop down for the Strength Ring. Then run past the night to unlock a shortcut to more Sombers. Down to the basement below the Dragon area for more. Left from the Dragon Slayer bonfire for another. Then finally run up the stairs past these enemies and quit out. Then grab the final ones from this chest. The next area is the Grand Archives. Run through until you reach the rooftops. Follow this route for our last flask upgrade. Run past the gank squad and send the elevator down to open the shortcut. Then up the big stairs and right at the top for another elevator shortcut. When the lift gets to the bottom, send it back up and jump on the secret elevator below to head down for our max weapon upgrade stone. Walk back to Firelink for a plus five weapon. Now back to the dancers arena and left into the Consume King's garden. And at the end of this, we find Osiris. Now, this fight is a piece of cake in phase one. Well telegraphed attacks that are fairly simple to dodge. But in phase two, things are far more hectic. Osiris has a charged attack with the quickest startup animation of any Souls game. I'm pretty sure it's just a single frame, so it's completely unreactable. So it's always best to leave this fight until a little later if you don't need to kill him yet. One of my favourite runs to do in this game was an early Moonlight Greatsword build, which involves fighting the Dancer and this guy as the 4th and 5th bosses. Which is a right laugh. Again, if you'd like to see something like that on the channel, let me know in the comments. Our Great Machete is the perfect length for bonking this guy on the head if you stand right in front of him. You'll get a stagger halfway through phase 2 for a relatively easy kill. After this fight, you can see an item on the ground. It's a gesture called Path of the Dragon. Make sure you grab it. Just on from this, you'll find the Untended Graves, the true version of the starting area. This is where we find Champion Gundir, a much more dangerous version of the tutorial boss. But like the tutorial, go for parries, and this is a pretty easy one.
use the champion's soul to get the prisoner's chain. This is basically Radagon's Saw Seal, but without the strength and dex benefits. Now back to Lothric Castle, and right up to the top for another incredible fight. The Twin Princes. Now, once again, you want to treat this fight like you're fighting Godfrey in Elden Ring. Rolling combos straight into a single R1, but you have to manage your stamina here. If you attack him with less than half stamina, you won't be able to roll his next attack, so you do have to keep an eye on that. Our damage means that you won't have to play well for too long though. In phase two, the big guy, Lorian, is joined by the smaller Lothric, who will cast some spells at you. The fight can only end when Lothric dies, so you have two options. You can strafe around Lorian to hit Lothric on his back, or what I find easier on certain builds, just focus on killing Lorian. Lothric will resurrect him each time, but you can use that downtime to attack Lothric. With this build, you can almost kill Lothric in one cycle doing this. Now it's time to head to DS3's secret area. Head back to the Irithyll dungeon and through to this room with the giant rats. Go left as soon as you leave. This will bring you to meditation class. And if you look at the way these guys are sitting, it might remind you of the gesture that we picked up earlier, Path of the Dragon. Soon after reaching Archdragon Peak, we'll encounter another boss, the Ancient Dragon. After a couple of tries getting flattened by this guy, you'll realize it's a puzzle boss. It's actually one of the better ones in my opinion, so I won't spoil it. After a short trip through the final area, we get to the big bell. Now, if you asked a room full of people who have never played Dark Souls before to name a boss from Dark Souls, I reckon they'd all give the same name, the Nameless King. This guy is infamous for being the hardest Souls boss, even though he isn't really. The first phase of the fight looks incredibly scary, but it's fine, especially with this build. Bonk the dragon on the head a few times for a stagger. Take the riposte and it's all but over. Honestly, the biggest hurdle in this fight is the camera, so make sure you try and stay in front of him. Now for the bit that's responsible for all of the broken controllers, the Nameless King himself. It's quite hard to explain what makes this guy difficult. He's certainly more of an Elden Ring boss than a DS3 boss with attacks that are more roll catchy and harder to read. But he just seems to have a different rhythm to everything else in the game. After Elden Ring, this guy shouldn't worry you too much.
And that's it for the base game. Now it's time to head into the DLCs. Head back to the Cleansing Chapel to speak to the Red Hooded Dude and be transported to the first DLC, The Ashes of Ariandel. This DLC is quite linear and we don't have anything to grab, so I'm not going to over explain the route too much. Ashes of Ariandel is a bit odd. While having some immensely cool lore attached to it, and a couple of cool new enemies, the areas themselves aren't that inspiring. And the first of the two bosses it contains is forgettable enough for me not to even include him in this video. I'm not saying it's a bad DLC, I'm just saying that it doesn't follow the usual From Software tradition of absolutely blowing our minds and making us feel like the whole of the base game was just a tutorial for this, the real deal. So is The Ashes of Ariandel a very rare example of From Software giving us something a bit average? Well, it certainly looks that way. Unless, of course, the final boss of the DLC is so atmospheric, so cinematic, and so ridiculously difficult yet satisfying to learn, you end up being so in awe of it that you couldn't give a flying fuck about the rest of the DLC. And that's exactly what happens when we reach Sister Freedom. This fight is incredible, and it's consistently near the top of the hardest bosses in Souls lists that you see everywhere. So let's break it down. In phase one, it's just Frida. She is incredibly fast, jarringly so. The best Elden Ring comparison is the Black Knife Assassins, but Frida can combo you to death faster than they can. So especially with our slow strength build, we can't trade with her. She does have two weaknesses. She has low poise, so she'll stagger when you hit her, and she's vulnerable to backstabs. The best place for these is during this attack where she disappears. Watch for the frost trail on the floor to get an idea of where she went, then backstab her during the wind up. If you can't find her, just run up the center of the arena, then strafe around her when she appears. Stick to these strats for the rest of phase one, and it's not too bad on this build. In phase two, she's joined by Father Ariandel. Now for this, try to ignore Frida. Unless you are standing right next to her, she won't melee attack you. She's just going to cast a long frost trail that you do want to try and avoid. So in phase two, just hit Ariandel. His attacks do massive damage, so try to only attack his side or his back. And get out of the way while he's thrashing around. You'll get a stagger near the end of the fight for the win. Yeah, this is the only fight in the Soul series that has three phases, and Black Flame Frida is the most difficult of them all. Pay attention to my distancing here. On a strength build, you want to maintain this kind of distance throughout the whole fight. She starts the fight with this terrifying jump attack. Fight your instincts and run straight into it. Roll when she hits the ground, then backstab her, following it with an R1 as she stands up. You can do this with both of her jump attacks in this phase. By maintaining this distance, you'll have enough time to roll out away from most of her combos when she closes the distance. Like phase one, she'll also disappear occasionally. It's a little harder to find her, but if you do, you can go for a backstab or a couple of R1s.
with the first DLC done, we can finally head to the best part of Dark Souls 3. The Ring City is the quintessential From Software DLC. Its two areas are without doubt the hardest and most brutal areas in the game, and the bosses follow in Frida's footsteps of making everything you've seen so far feel like the tutorial. Make your way through the drag heap until you reach this hut by the angel. The angels in this area are flying mobile ballistas that do massive damage. For our final ring, you want to follow this route for the ring of favour and protection. You can actually access this DLC before Ariandel if you like. So you can come here and grab this before Frida if you're really struggling. Now back to the hut and run towards the other one, jumping off onto this branch at the last second. Here you can kill the guy who's summoning the angel and make it to the next bonfire. And close by is the first boss fight, the demons. Now this fight is a bit like Godskin Duo. If the duo had way more health and were demons as big as houses that could inflict poison on you. One demon is orange, the other is red. We want to kill the orange one, the demon from below, first. Whichever demon is imbued with flame will be hyper aggressive and the other will snipe you with poison. If you get poisoned by either of them, just let them kill you and start again. You're not coming back from that. I like to fight whichever one is on fire, but leave the red one with a smidge of health before killing the orange one. And yeah, this is a two phase fight. Whichever demon dies last will become the demon prince. The orange one is far harder to deal with, which is why we kill him first. The only real tip or trick for this fight is to take advantage of the attack where he summons two balls that shoot fire at you and spews fire himself. The balls will stop firing at you before he finishes breathing, so use that time to get in some attacks. Apart from that, this is just a fight you have to learn the rhythms of. With a big weapon like this though, I like to stay in front of him and hit the head for staggers. After this, we reach the Ring T, which along with Bloodborne's fishing hamlet, gets my vote for the most dangerous area of any FromSoft game. There's nothing to grab on the way, just have fun exploring. But to save you some suffering, when you get to this section, with this insanely powerful dragon, run back on yourself and unlock a shortcut to a bonfire. Getting past this dragon can be very difficult, but happily on this build, we can run to this cliff, tank a hit and jump down to safety. A little bit later though, he catches up with you. But it's okay, we're Elden Ring players. Dragons aren't that much of a problem. Yeah, it, it turns out this one is a bit strong. Eventually, you'll get a stagger and can repost him off the cliff for the kill. I'll never forget the feeling of playing this DLC for the first time when it came out. Spending half an hour fighting this dragon 
only for him to mysteriously not drop any runes as he fell. I just knew what was coming. Through the next area, you can activate a lift and unlock a gate as a shortcut to a previous bonfire. Then onto the next boss, half Life. And you have to feel a little sorry for half Light, Not because he's a trash boss in a DLC beside the all-time greats, but because he's a Moonvale user. If you weren't around for the very early days of Elden Ring PvP, this fight is the perfect place to experience it. When he's down, head back to the ringed inner wall bonfire, to the shortcut we opened earlier, and walk into this secret opening halfway down the lift, through an invisible wall, and take the jump down to what I still think is From Software's best dragon fight. Dark Eater Medir. Medir is considered the hardest boss in Dark Souls 3 by many. And it's easy to see why. His health bar is absolutely gigantic. I know it probably doesn't look that bad, but I'm sure this weapon has the highest AR in the game. And his attacks do a devastating amount of damage. Despite everything your instincts tell you, the best way to fight him is standing right in front of him. Although you will have to learn the timings of all of his combos, being right here will always give you an opportunity to get a hit in after every one of his attacks. Whenever he starts breathing fire though, get out of there quick. When he gets to phase two, he'll also throw out some dark sorceries at you. Just run to the side to avoid these. Now we have two bosses left. And after making the necessary preparations, we're gonna head back to Firelink Shrine to place the Lord Souls and finish the base game. The final boss of the base game is the Soul of Cinder. In phase one, he has four different entire movesets, mimicking four completely different builds. This totals a staggering number of attacks to learn, the most of any boss in the Souls series. So the only way to learn this guy is by fighting him again and again and again. Happily, with all of our levels from the DLC, our damage and health is enough to beat him here, even if you play horrendously, as I definitely did. In phase two, he's a lot more simple. But if you're an old school Souls player, it's so much more special. And finally, back to the Ring City for the final boss. I've never had a definitive favorite From Software boss. I'm too indecisive, but there are three that have always stuck out as the very best. None are in Elden Ring, and the other two are from a different game. But here, at the end of the world, we find the other one. The Ring City was the final DLC 
for what we all knew would be the final Dark Souls game. And that final DLC would need a final boss. And back when I first played this DLC, I remember thinking that there's no way that you could make a final boss for a series so renowned for its bosses and to have it live up to the hype and the expectation. But once again, I forgot that I was talking about From Software. Handed over that thing, your dark soul, for my lady's painting. Slave Nightgale is the best boss of the Dark Souls series. His attacks feel like storytelling. He reminds you of so many other fights you've encountered in Dark Souls and is the perfect full stop at the end of it. The spine-tingling music, the incredible lore, and a complex moveset that's so deeply satisfying to learn. This fight serves as a perfect reminder of what From Software are capable of when they turn everything up to 11 to put their final stamp on a game. And if that doesn't get you excited for what they have in store for us in Shadow of the Earth Tree, I'm not sure what will. Thanks for watching.